Um, it is a cliche in Washington to call someone hardworking. We're all about the hard work around here. Um, but it really is impossible to avoid that word when talking about our next guest, Senator Mark Kirk. His bio just makes your head spin. He has a BA from Cornell, a master's from the London School of Economics, a law degree from Georgetown. He's worked at the World Bank, at the State Department. He practiced law at Baker and McKenzie. He was just reminding me that the last time we probably saw each other was when he was at Baker and McKenzie and, uh, and trying to help us get pro bono assistance from the firm. Uh, and he served as counsel to the House International Relations. Uh, I'll interrupt you, Elisa. When we came over and made the pitch to have Baker and McKenzie lawyers work pro bono for uh, human rights cases, <laughs> They were such a bunch of rapacious billers that I couldn't get anybody <laughs> to join. Yeah, so we're going to make another go at it. We just agreed. <laughs> uh, Senator Kirk is a decorated intelligence officer for the Navy Reserve, where he served since 1989. And I haven't even mentioned his political uh, career yet. I first met him, I remember, when he was a legislative assistant to former Illinois Representative John Porter, who co-founded the House Human Rights Caucus with the late Tom Lantos. Five years after that, working time and a half, uh, is what Mr. Porter said, uh, Senator Kirk became his chief of staff. And in 2000, he won the House seat formerly held by Congressman Porter. And he served five terms in the House before being elected to the Senate in 2010. With his characteristic diligence, the self-described policy wonk has become a Senate leader on a whole range of critical issues, national security, foreign policy, and human rights. And he has used his platform uh, to speak out on behalf of activists persecuted in Iran and Egypt and many other places. As many of you already know, Senator Kirk's career was interrupted in 2012 when he suffered a serious stroke. To no one's surprise, he battled his way back to health and after a year of rehabilitation made a triumphant return to the Senate, entering the chamber to raucous applause from his colleagues. And then he got right back down to work. Uh, he picked up where he left off doing important work on a wide range of issues of special interest to human rights. First, he has focused on the intersection of human rights and national security. This fall, in a move that must surely have resonated with his mentor, uh, Mr. Porter, Senator Kirk teamed up with Senator Chris Coons, who we heard from yesterday, to establish the first ever Senate Human Rights Caucus. This bipartisan project is just the kind of effort we need to promote strong American leadership on human rights. And I'm very pleased and, and, and honored to have Senator Kirk here today to have a discussion about that effort. So please join me again in welcoming Senator Mark Kirk. Now, Senator Kirk, what was it that, that made you and, and Senator Coons decide to found this Human Rights Caucus? There's long been a, a caucus in the House, um, but the Senate really has never had a place to focus attention on that. For my work on human rights, uh, uh, we try to focus always on one person that I've always had one staffer since I was uh, a congressman uh, and a senator whose job it was to get one person out of jail per year. We uh, try to focus on the one case and I, lots of times I'll come in uh, and the Dr. Tai of Ethiopia with us, the staffer was working on that. Uh, I came in every morning and said, is Dr. Tai out? Is Dr. Tai out? thought that with the attention that we could focus was uh, you could always get bust somebody out of jail. And uh, the hardest cases I've been working on a, a set of uh, Iranian cases. We uh, started a whole new program in the Senate called the I Iranian Dissident Assistance Pro Program, IDAP, which we run off our website. And I was so proud of uh, Gretchen Blum, who is here, uh, my staff and human. Gretchen, why don't you wave to the crowd here? There she, there is. she is, right there. <laughs> That uh, the, my primary uh, person to focus with regression on it was uh, Nasrin Satude from, uh, from uh, Iran, who was a human rights lawyer who was thrown in jail in the infamous Evan prison, a mother of two, and her crime was, uh, was uh, for representing people in the Green Movement that uh, ran a pretty successful campaign for president in Iran. 
and I, I thought that uh, Nasrin was the good symbol. And uh, we built that case up to such a level. When, uh, when President Rouhani uh, decided to come to the United States to attend the UN General Assembly, I was preparing to blanket uh, New York, funded out of my uh, campaign for Senate, with Nasser Institute uh, uh, posters all over. And I learned just as he was flying to New York, he decided to release her. These and things so really make a yeah. difference. Yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes we get asked by people in the administration, you know, well, are you sure that it's not going to endanger people? And we, we have are in close touch with, with uh, dissidents on the ground in many countries. And, and uniformly, they say, you know, this really can save lives, this kind of focused attention on a particular person. And later, after they get out, we also find that um, oftentimes not only did um, it have an impact on the government holding them, but it had an incredible impact on them personally knowing that uh, the outside world uh, cared and knew about their plight. We actually Oftentimes had- Oftentimes it uh, really improves how they're cared for in yes. prison. Yeah. Indeed. We had another uh, former occupant of the notorious uh, Evin prison here with us yesterday, uh, Dr. Hale Esfandiari, um, who is an eloquent uh, um, activist and, and academic on- At least I would raise one other issue that I am worried about in Iran. They have accelerated their executions. They are now up to 800. And uh, so we might not have some of these prisoners to work for uh, if they keep, uh, keep executing so many so fast. Yeah, it's a horrible situation there. And it's very important, the, the role that you've played. And uh, I really like the approach that you outlined there about you know sometimes we see the problems in the world are so vast and they can feel so overwhelming. And this idea of saying, start somewhere and find someone who you can really help is really quite inspiring. Um, I, I'd like to hear more, though, about, about the caucus and where you think it will go and, and how an organization like ours and all these folks here who care about human rights might what, support What could it. happen? Uh, what I would like everybody here to help me recruit other uh, senators to join us, Senator Coons and I, we're a bipartisan, uh, bicameral, to make sure that we're the safest possible caucus to join. I would like the greater human rights community to say to uh, various senators in the Senate, we would really like to see you join the uh, Human Rights Caucus. That will help us, Chris and I, uh, build our numbers and uh, clout. One of the things that, uh, that we have been talking about over the last day and a half at the summit here is how you know, human rights should not be a left-right you know, issue. Um, and and in, in historically, it hasn't. Yeah. It's not a left or a right issue, as uh, John McCain said on the uh, floor yesterday. We look at the United States, and uh, it's the, obviously the most powerful country on earth, not because of our uh, military, not because of our economy. The reason why they're the most powerful uh, country on earth is because of our values. The US society is the greatest force for human dignity and freedom that has ever been designed. And uh, oftentimes, as a, uh, as a senator for uh, Chicago, I have been meeting with Eastern European groups that have been struggling with what I would call the Putin factor. I would say in the struggle between the U.S. and Russia, uh, there's no doubt who is going to prevail. It's the U.S. I say to all the Ukrainians who are having asylum with us, like 50,000 of them, that uh, we are going to win the, maybe the economic and the political uh, contest between these two countries because of these people's uh, presence, because we represent uh, freedom and human rights and dignity for individuals. You know, that, that is so, um, it, it, that's very eloquent. And also, uh, I think, you know, the people we work with internationally um, feel very strongly that they want to be able to point to the United States as the moral example for the world. And, and uh, you know, that's why it was uh, so distressing to see um, with the report being released from the Senate Intelligence Committee yesterday, um, you know those uh, those details um, very uh, very troubling. And obviously, there are people in the world who will uh, seek to take advantage of us talking about our own failings. Um, but in fact, you know, in many ways, as painful as it is to look at 
the things, the mistakes that we've made. Um, it is what makes us stronger is our ability. I mean, you would never see a report like that happen in Iran or in Russia or in China or in so many places. Lisa, uh, let me say something about that report. I was disappointed by the report because, uh, as you know, I was a reservist. I uh, one of the only members of Congress to uh, serve in Afghanistan, that uh, I had the chance to serve with our troops in Afghanistan. My perspective has been uh, the perspective of an infantry colonel in the U.S. Army who was in charge of 90 or so soldiers. Uh, they probably all trained together and uh, lifted over to Afghanistan together. He probably understands how many wives and how many, uh, how many children are involved in the lives of these soldiers. Wants to make sure all 90 of his little chickadees come home nicely. In the case of this uh, report, I've been worried about people taking the most salacious details out, out of context, make, inflaming the local Afghan uh, town where this infantry uh, platoon is uh, stationed, that uh, if, if uh, people in the town take action against our soldiers, that the point is to think of, we're the United States of America. We're the ones actually opening uh, girls' schools in Afghanistan. Uh, and not leading to more Taliban uh, uh, tyranny over the country. That sometimes that message can get lost in their very good social media, which ISIS and other people have. Yeah. yeah. But yes, but we we know that um, you know that uh, obviously, as Senator McCain said yesterday, sadly, there are uh, forces of violence and intolerance in the world uh, don't need much of an excuse uh, to do what they do. Um, and it's a sign, I think, of great uh, courage and um, integrity for a nation that can uh, talk publicly about its mistakes and seek to correct them in a way that's responsible. It's never a good time to hear bad news about what we have done, um, but I think it is one of the uh, features of our democracy that makes us, that sets us apart. Um, every country makes mistakes and behaves in a way that, that, that may violate their, um, their principles at times right. uh, of um, intense distress. But what separates us is, is how we then deal with right. it. Um, so I, I very much appreciate uh, the, um, the comments that you made about uh, the forwardly deployed. We are the most forwardly deployed uh, nation in the world, and we have the most to lose. Uh, um, from things like that, but we also, we're out there because we're trying to create the kind of world that we want our children to grow up in. And, right. and this report, I think, is going to ultimately help us do that. Right. Um, you know, one of the things that, um, when, when we saw the launch of the caucus and you and Senator Coons working together, um, I mean, uh, outside of Washington, uh, you know, most people assume that there could be no such thing going on. Uh, bipartisan uh, coming together around uh, core values and um, it's encouraging I think and it, it, it should get more attention uh, outside of Washington where really the, st the main story is how you know we can barely keep our government open and uh, um, so uh, I wonder what you uh, can tell us about how we can help the caucus and uh, including you know as you said um, increase its membership and what kinds of issues would you like to be exploring? I, I would there? say uh, that my role in the Senate is, uh, I see, is one of being the bridge builder between both sides. Coming from Illinois as a Republican, uh, uh, that it's natural for me to be the moderate, sensible voice to uh, use my, uh, uh, my uh, membership in this world's exclusive, most exclusive club to always be uh, building social bonds between both sides. I've been particularly successful with Senator Manchin, my uh, best friend in the Senate. And my secret has been Senator Manchin's boat, that uh, we invite uh, senators out <laughs> onto, his, onto his boat. And what, it's amazing how uh, the social bonds between uh, both parties can uh, melt away when you open a cooler for a, full of beer. <laughs> they, uh, they, uh, you know, we, because we're on a boat, we uh, don't let the senators off until things are going well. 
So if you're, if you're not going to play nice in the sandbox, you're going to have to swim. That's a good strategy. Yeah. Maybe we should try that with the whole government. Yeah. It, it, it has been working really nicely in the Senate, I would say. That's really good. You know, uh, uh, Jim uh, Ziegler, who is the former sergeant at arms at the Senate and, um, and serves on the board of, uh, of Human Rights First, um, uh, was taking us all on a tour of the Capitol and showed us the room where he said senators from, uh, and members of Congress from both parties used to gather to have a cocktail and talk things over. And That room was the reason why uh, Joe and I started uh, having lunch together uh, at least once a week. That uh, what you should know about the Senate, it is run by a set of partisan lunches three times a week, all Democrats and all Republicans separate. Joe and I said, that's for the birds. Uh, we started having uh, lunch together in that room. Uh -huh. The weirdest thing about Washington is these traditions that keep going. The government just keeps rolling and rolling. You would open the door to the room and the entire room would be set up for lunch every day. And uh, we didn't have a bipartisan group in there. And so Joe and I started using that room for that purpose. That's great. That's really good to hear. Well, we'd like to encourage more of that, obviously. Um, uh, I wanted to ask you about, um, I mean, in your long career in, in government, you know, uh, working on human rights from many different angles, you know, one of the things that, um, that we have seen that's a big lever uh, to um, improve human rights performance of other uh, governments is through the foreign assistance, uh, U.S. foreign assistance uh, programs, including international security assistance. Um, and uh, I wonder where you are thinking about using that kind of leverage. Yeah, the clerk of the Foreign Ops Committee is a dear friend of mine. I've known him for about 25 years, Tim Reeser. He's completely dedicated to advancing human rights through the appropriations process. Under Chairman Leahy, I think uh, that's probably quite appropriate to make sure U.S. taxpayer dollars are always advancing our uh, values and uh, human rights and dignity of individuals. That's so important. Tim is really a, a, an unsung hero in Washington and someone yes. who for decades has, has really um, made the most out of, uh, out of the foreign assistance programs to advance human rights. And it's great to know that you're doing that and, um, and engaged there. Um, uh, I, uh, I'm watching our timekeeper here and I want to make sure we have an opportunity uh, to engage this great audience. Um, so I'm going to uh, give you a, a warning that I'm about to call on you for questions, and, um, um, and I'm going to just ask one more of, of my own. Um, I, I, we, when we were walking over here, uh, we started talking about trafficking. Um, and we had a, a, a very interesting panel this morning uh, about how to combat the, the, the big business this, of this trafficking. This is a very important issue to me. The number one trafficker in America is a company called uh, Backpage.com. They probably offer, uh, they, I, I think they uh, make millions of dollars per month that uh, Cindy McCain and I, uh, we want to make sure that uh, we pass some new legislation, making that company uh, liable for the damage they're calling, especially to young women. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you all know what Backpage.com is? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a website that... If, if you uh, participate in it, uh, you're actively helping out human trafficking in the United States. I would say that uh, if there's one legacy for the state of Illinois politically, to our gift to the country has been uh, advancing human dignity and freedom. I would say that's through Abraham Lincoln's uh, candidacy uh, for the presidency and Everett Dirksen's uh, championship of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Yep that I want to make sure that uh, we do everything possible to uh, kill that company. All right, I am gonna open it up for questions and we have mics going around, so please then um, identify yourself and uh, right back there in the red. Hi, uh, my name's Sylvia Standard. I'm with the Church of Scientology and I was gonna ask you about that bill, but can you tell us just a little bit about what we can do to help get your bill passed through the Senate? Because I know it's already passed through the House so what can human rights activists do to help you get that bill passed, the one that you've What had? I really need, you know, the bill is called the, bill is called the SAVE Act. It uh, attempts to, uh, to uh, not make the Communications Decency Act protect every uh, bad act in the Internet. As you may know, the Internet is the Wild West, especially the dark. There is a philosophical issue here. 
if, uh, if total freedom on the internet means we can have the freedom to drop to the absolute bottom, uh, what has the Civil War meant for the United States? Can, if uh, if uh, online slavery is now empowered by something as powerful as the internet, there has to be some break at this point, some point where we uh, say, once it leads to online slavery, we will not go there. I've been seeking to amend the Communications Decency Act to make them uh, companies like this liable for the damages that it caused. I've been working very well with the uh, Cook County, uh, the Democratic uh, Sheriff of Cook County, a, guy, a phenomenal public servant named uh, Tom Dart, who has he investigated 800 Backpage.com uh, uh, cases. All of them are directly leading to uh, prostitution with uh, traffic women that uh, we understand uh, about to f average, they uh, make about $500,000 per girl, which is a phenomenal profit make to make off that, uh, that traffic. We heard this morning that the, uh, uh, the global business of uh, modern day slavery is a $150 billion enterprise. And, and one of the things that, uh, one of the biggest challenges is making sure that, you know, if you're gonna take down a business that big, uh, and that complex, it takes resources, law enforcement resources. Um, Let's look, look, look at our history here. Uh, we had uh, a huge government, very, very militarily capable, that uh, defended the slavery interest, in, interest that was called the Confederacy, and luckily we beat them. Uh, yeah. So hopefully it won't, we won't have to go to war over it, but. <laughs> uh, yes, so, yeah. back here, yes, with your hand up. Hi, I'm Nick Nelson. Um, Thank you for being here, Mr. Senator. It's an honor to hear you speak. I wanted to ask you, how can the United States properly address the human rights records of some of our closest allies, such as Saudi Arabia or Bahrain? And when is it appropriate to stop engaging openly and using trade and then to take a more harder line with uh, sanctions and things like that? Is there a determining factor for how we do that or is it more economic interests? So how can we how, how can we engage? What I would say is let's uh, our touchstone should be effectiveness. Can we actually uh, get people out of jail? Can we actually improve the situation on the ground? If we're just randomly condemning people, uh, you may be not helping and get too many people out of uh, out of uh, jail. That that is why I totally focus on individuals to make sure that I would say to anybody who's a young person just starting out in Washington that you, a lot of people come to this city wanting to do foreign policy and defense. The best way to learn the whole uh, the ropes is to pick your prisoner of conscience. I would say the Amnesty, uh, process, Amnesty International process of vetting people is ex extremely well uh, respected. Pick your prisoner of conscience and uh, engage with your elected officials and get your prisoner out of, out of jail. That's the way to really learn the ropes. And the, if I, would, uh, if I was giving career advice to a young person here in, the, in town, I would give that advice. Well, there are a number of those folks in the room right now, so you're giving it. Um, uh, but I want to follow up just a little bit on that question, um, because one of the things that, uh, that we find uh, sometimes is that, uh, you know, there is this, this sense that human rights and has to be balanced against other in, uh, interests of the United States. Um, and we've always tried to make the case that, you know, human rights really are foundational and without respect for human rights kind of at the core of U.S. policy, those other interests, whether they be security or economic and other broader diplomatic interests, ultimately will not be achieved. Um, but there is this persistent kind of frame that, you know, human rights is is kind of in conflict, if you will, with other interests. How do we tackle that? And maybe the caucus will be a way that we can. It certainly can be as long as we focus on individuals. Senators have a very big uh, bully pulpit. And uh, as in the case with uh, Nasrin, I uh, didn't think the odds were with us when we took on this case with Iran, that I thought uh, w when an American senator takes on Iran, uh, it might actually hurt her in uh, jail and, and then we were successful. Mm -hmm. The uh, case that I that we had with uh, with uh, Natan Sharansky uh, tells me instructive. Uh, I uh, learned the ropes of this whole field with through Soviet Jewry. Mm -hmm. That we were up against the Soviet Union at the time. We thought that maybe uh, you know we'll never succeed. And one of the best uh, moments of my public service 
was when I got to go to Israel, I got to meet a number of the refuseniks that I worked on in that case as a staffer, all happy and all free in Israel. You might, I would, the key aspect is don't get discouraged and just drill into your case. It may look totally daunting. Uh, it, it, you are gonna succeed if you never give up. I'd say that. Great. Okay, there's someone way in the back. Yes. Is there a mic back there? It's coming. Okay. Hi, my name is Aliyah Awadallah. I honestly hate to be the person in the room that brings this up because it always come up at, comes up at things like this, but when are we going to address the elephant in the room and address the human rights of people in the Palestinian ter territories as well? Um, <laughs> I mean, come on, we're at a human rights summit. We're in a room with a bunch of intellectual elites. We have to be able to talk about this issue, especially at a time now where we are in a position to influence it a little bit better and there is tension between the United States and Israel that hasn't been there since before the Cold War. Are we going to start making moves towards that, and is that a priority for your caucus? No, uh, I, I, I sanctioning Israel is not a priority for the caucus. Yeah, yeah. I, I would so say... The, yes, let me just, if I could, just repeat the question about, um, which I, I take the question to be about, you know, ensuring uni yes palestine and, and ensuring universality when when the united states is talking about you know today is the is the anniversary of the universal declaration of human rights and you know the first word in that uh in that document is universal and and so it's very important for us um, particularly as the you know the leader in having drafted that document and building the international consensus around it um, that that we make it absolutely clear that that those rights are universal and we're going to stand for them wherever they uh, I would say that Israel being a fully functioning democracy now sometimes with the uh, Supreme Court of Israel overruling the government uh, showing they really are a country of the laws and uh, the Israeli public has all the attention side not wanting wanting to be the government to be on the right side of values individuality that uh, I would say I'm a pretty strong ally of Israel. In the case of human rights, uh, with, uh, if, you look at the, uh, if you look at the actual situation on the ground, I would say in uh, Israeli-Palestinian communities, you uh, have people who actually can vote for the member of the Knesset. That village is not shelling another village. That wherever there's democracy present, you have uh, peace and some development. Wherever you have like the tyranny of uh, Fatah or Hezbollah, you have almost no economic growth, hostility and uh, oppression and extrajudicial killings. That uh, uh, in my case, I, I have to side with a side that supports the rule of law. Western style uh, democracy, openness, not taking the, the world back to the 14th century, some twisted version of the Quran that uh, many Muslim experts say is not valid is not the way to go. Well, I think um, it, it's a very important question that you asked and, uh, and, and one of the things that we've learned and that we have to keep learning, I think, as a nation, we learned it again yesterday, is that, um, is that no country has a monopoly on the moral authority. We, you know, we want uh, to live up to those ideals in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, and, and we and, and uh, other countries certainly uh, have persistently fallen short. And so we have to keep working to make sure that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, is really that, is universal. Um, and okay, we have time for uh, one more question. I'm looking at the um, way, way back here in the back, yes? Hi, my name is Leah McElrath. I wanted to go back for a minute to address the issue of Saudi and Bahrain. Um, they're our close allies. <laughs> and Saudi has executed and beheaded more people than ISIS ever has. And is there anything being done by the US government to address that? Um, a good friend of mine, Walid Abouker, was the only human rights lawyer in Saudi. And he's been imprisoned <laughs> under a counterterrorism law. Um, are you aware of his case? Uh, because he's been in prison for about 100 days, actually almost a year now. Um, and he was the only human rights lawyer in Saudi. 
Uh, and they put him in prison under the counterterrorism law simply because he was supporting the rights of the people to speak out. Um, I won't even get into the women issue. <laughs> so how can we present ourselves as being the country for human rights when our closest allies are pe people who are trying to take their own countries back to the 14th century? Thank you. So the question I, I hear as uh, going back really to the previous one about the, this tension when, we, uh, when the United States allies are um, violating human rights and imprisoning human rights activists, um, uh, don't we need to be concerned about that? We do. What can we do about it? We do. If the uh, democratic space is uh, growing and growing, uh, that's uh, in the interest of the national security of the United States that uh, I think the uh, factoid uh, needs to be checked out. No country with a McDonald's uh, uh, franchise in it has ever attacked the U.S. Uh, uh, that, I think that's a very trivial, trivial uh, factoid that shows the, uh, the more expansion of uh, free enterprise and uh, freedom. That means the country is going to be a... Uh, let's look at the case of Japan. In, uh, in 1945, uh, John Dos Santos wrote a uh, very, very influential article in Life saying the occupation of Japan has failed. The argument was that uh, for uh, recorded history, the Japanese had been, uh, been uh, uh, oppressive and a militaristic and vicious society. And uh, certainly in recent memory that uh, the German society had been murderous and rapacious. The argument they make uh, that U.S. values can never take hold here. I would say that thank God that, Secretary, that President Hugh Truman did not uh, feel down and out when, he, uh, when the occupation actually did work. And Japan is now a free and open society, a strong ally, a bastion for freedom in Asia. I would say uh, that uh, now, now uh, the, uh, the uh, specter of a rapacious German uh, genocidal mania is no longer present in Europe, that uh, our values taken root in, in, in Europe, that we should always try to advance those values on the basis of the uh, Japanese and German experience. Um, I wanted to just pick up on that, if I could, in, uh, in closing, to say, uh, you know, eternal vigilance, uh, because, um, you know, including U.S. allies, uh, um, we, we spoke yesterday on a panel about the resurgence of extremism in Europe, uh, particularly um, with the rise of Nazi and um, fascist parties in, in Greece and Hungary. Um, that we have to pay close attention to that uh, and, uh, and as much attention, I think, to our friends uh, as, um, as we do with other uh, countries because, um, you know, the, the impulse to violate rights and, and dominate people while the, while the arc of history, as Martin Luther King said, is, is long and it bending towards justice, um, it doesn't get there by itself. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why we're so grateful for the creation of this caucus in the Senate, a forum to put human rights at the, on the agenda of the Senate every day. And uh, we look forward to working with you and right. Senator Coons uh, to I make that I would say to the crowd, if there's a compelling case, and I'll let me, uh, let me uh, put my uh, personal preferences where, I th where you think I can bust this, the uh, prisoner out of jail, I really want to work on that case. Well, I think if we they, just heard about one, so I think you'll be hearing from people. I want to thank you one. so much. Thank you so and, much, uh, Senator Kirk. We'll have uh, Gretchen Blum. Thank you. Thank uh, please join me in thanking Senator Kirk for his leadership and for being with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you.